Hello, 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 everyone. It's good to see your digital non-existent faces in the chat. Uh, good to see you, Chiacres. Good to see you, C. Good to see you, Mitzi. Come on in, come on in, come in. Thank you for tuning in live to this here Lecture 11 of Professor Chong's Tabletop Workshop, Running a One-Shot. If you're new here, if you're just discovering this VOD because of YouTube or because of Twitter or something, come on in. Thank you for tuning in. Um, Professor Chong's Tabletop Workshop, also known as PC. TW uh, is my uh, GM advice live streamed workshop series where I just give a variety of GM tips about a variety of subjects. You might be thinking, who are you to give me tips about this here GMing? Why should I trust these words coming out of your mouth? I don't even know you. Well, I am a professional GM. I have been a professional GM for the past two years or so. Uh, I've done incredible streamed actual play games with a bunch of incredible companies and folks. Um, so I like to think that I know what I'm talking about and it's very important to me to also share this knowledge that I've accumulated for new and experienced GMs for folks who just want to add some more tools to their tool belt and more uh, more toys to their toy box. So uh, a few announcements before we get right into things. Uh, ARC 4 Episode 3 of Transplaner RPG, which is my main squeeze actual play stream production that I'm the GM and producer for, uh, airs this coming Saturday as of the recording of this live stream, which is going to be October 2nd, 2021 at 3 p.m. U.S. Central Time. If you missed it, no worries. Uh, Transplaner RPG streams Saturdays always at 3 p.m. U.S. Central Time on Twitch at Transplaner RPG. If you don't know what that is, it is the all transgender, people of color uh, led, 100% homebrew Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition live streamed actual play campaign uh, set in an original non-colonial anti-orientalist world that I run. Uh, I have four lovely players that I run it for. Uh, as part of Transplanar RPG's slate of programming right now, we are in the middle of volume one of Endake Anthologies, which is a brand new slate of miniseries set in the Transplanar RPG Endake universe, featuring an all new cast of guest stars who are all trans and all bimpok. Right now, we are on episode three of the Hounds of Mercy versus Mercy Seven Evil X's and all of Endake, which is a really fun D&D &D romp across Andake set in the post-apocalypse where a group of queer, gay, troubled monster hunters try to hunt down their uh, leader's exes and also maybe try to restore balance to the world in the process. Uh, so episode three of that airs this coming Tuesday, October 5th at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time on twitch.tv slash RPG and will be airing for eight episodes total. So tune in Tuesdays at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time on Twitch for Hounds of Mercy and Saturdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Central Time for our main campaign. And with those announcements out of the way, I suppose it is time to get right into the lecture. So a really quick overview of running a one-shot, what we're going to be discussing today. First off, I'm going to do a quick introduction for those who are super new. What is a one-shot? What's the value of running one-shots? Why one-shots over campaign play or miniseries play, etc.? And then I'm going to delve a little bit more into like general tips when thinking about one-shots, as well as uh, the differences in player expectations that you need to set for one-shots versus for a, camp for a more um sustained campaign uh, play. Uh, and finally, I'm going to get into the specifics of how I like to prep one shots. And perhaps you can um, poach some of what I do for your own GM prep stuff. Uh, yeah, and we're going to round things off as always with audience questions. If you are a patron to my by Connie Chong Patreon pledge at the apprentice tier or higher, you get to tune in live to Professor Chong's tabletop workshop and ask questions live. Otherwise, the VOD will be available for the public uh, and for tippers and below um uh after after it's been streamed so let's get right into things shall we introduction wise what's a one shot uh it's pretty much what it says on the tin a one shot is a single session single story contained uh session of a tabletop role play game so when we think of ttrpgs like dungeons and dragons pathfinder a mask plays in the dark whatever uh we usually think of campaign play like a group of friends getting together sitting around a table and telling stories week after week or month after month for hours and days and weeks at a time, right? A one shot is like that, but it only happens once. 
Uh, and this can happen for a variety of reasons, scheduling issues. Maybe it's a completely new group, right? So you want to like feel them out first in like a lower stakes one shot situation before committing to a more campaign style uh, game with them. Uh, maybe it's a paid game that you got on Start Playing Games or Magpie Games curated play program that has just like a one shot experience you can do to like try out a new system or to just like play the game, but you don't have anyone else you, you know, who's available to play it with, right? There's a variety of reasons why you might be drawn to playing a one shot, um, but they're fair, they're really common. I would say like a lot of people I know in the TTRPG community have played in at least one one shot or run a one shot before. Um, and yeah, just like any, like a lot of the same tenants when it comes to like prepping for a campaign stands for prepping for a one shot. You still want to make sure you get those safety tools out of the way, right? Make sure everyone's on the same page about like the content that will and won't be in this game, right? Like make sure you like create your characters, etc. Like a lot of like the general broad things that you do for campaign play also apply for a one shot, right? But the obvious main difference is that, well, it's a one shot. This is one opportunity, one chance. This is it. It's you sit down for three, four, five, however many hours that you've blocked away time in your calendar for, for this one shot, this one session, one game, and you do it. Uh, so yeah, that's, I mean, I feel like it's a pretty succinct introduction to what they are and why people play them. Um, I personally love one shots. I think they're one of, I think they're when I burn the brightest as a GM in a lot of regards, because, um, the contained nature of the stories you're able to tell through a one shot is something that I'm really drawn to, right? I also really like planning for like longer term campaign play. Um, but one shots are really fun if you've got like one really cool hook you want to try out or like one really strong premise, right? Or like a, a story that takes place in a single room or a single location, right? Are, are great for one shots. Um, so yeah, I guess that's a good place for us to transition into general tips about running one shots. As you may have already uh, gathered from what I've said so far, I think the biggest thing f on the GM side of the table is to have a really clear, solid hook, right? For your one shot and a really clear objective. Um, the more successful one shots I've run and been a part of have knocked these out of the park, right? Uh, like they either have like, it's, it's a both and situation where both the outside hook of what the heroes, the PCs are going to be doing is really clear and um, the the kinds of characters the PCs are playing are also really clear. Uh, so for example, uh, a masks one shot that I've run in the past is the four of you are super like teenage superheroes you've been on a team for a while and like the one shot is like this one adventure we dip into your team like team dynamic for and like play through right like you have to stop this one villain from like bombing a memorial <laughs> right like boom that's it not necessarily the most fun one i've come up with on the fly but that's an example of like it's really clear you have to stop someone from doing something at like a single place right and who are you you're a group of teenage superheroes who have fought crime together before right and that's boom that's all you need you just hit the ground running you've got that clear hook you've got that objective and you can just sort of spin off of the prep from from that as a starting point right um another general tip i would say uh railroading has such a bad rap in the TTRPG community because it means different things to different people. When we think of railroading in a negative way, we think, oh, player agency doesn't matter. No matter what choices I make as a player, it's always going to lead to the same conclusion, right? Or like it's, situa it's stories where like the GM, it's really clear the GM has like one solution to their puzzle and they're like you're playing the GM guessing game instead of, a, oh, I'm going to do interesting things and maybe those will pan out. But the GM's like, nope, you try that. Nope, doesn't work. Oh, you try that key. Nope, it doesn't work. Oh, you try to brute force the door open nope it doesn't work because they have like a very specific secret password that they've planned and they've populated the room with clues and you know the players are like i don't know what it, you know so those things are you know i would say i would say i think that's bad gming <laughs> straight up i don't think that's really great or generous gming for your players that's not what i'm talking about when i say another tip i have is put them on rails a little bit what i'm talking about is make it really clear to the players hey we're here to play this premise right? Come prepped for this premise because I don't have other things prepped. So if you go off the quote unquote rails or the, or the actual meat of the session I've planned, it's not really on you as a GM at that point, especially because if you've communicated it to the players, like, oh, we're going to be stopping this villain from bombing the memorial, right? And if your PCs are like, let's go just eat hot dogs and not, not do anything about the plot, right? Uh, you know, that probably might work in a campaign because then you can sort of maybe like be like, okay, I guess I can improvise some stuff around the hot dog scene. 
but it probably works so well, won't work so well for a one shot. And I tend to find that players who know they're walking into a one shot are really interested in playing through the premise that that you present to them in the first place. Um, so yeah, what I mean by don't be afraid of of putting putting the party on rails a little bit is don't be afraid to sort of um, funnel them toward what you've prepped, right? Or if they go to a place you don't expect them to go, just pluck the thing you've planned for another location and just put it in the, the location they end up going to, right? So there's a lot of moving parts, but a lot of the uh, encounters and set pieces can be agile, right? So like it, maybe you had planned they're going to go to like this like forest, right? And like stop a hag. Maybe they go to a swamp instead of the forest. You can still put the hag in the swamp. No big deal, right? It's a one shot. Like make sure that the, the stuff you prep actually comes to fruition is my other tip. And like, don't be so tied to like a single place or a single trigger for players to discover information or interact with the plot at large. Uh, so that's what I mean by don't be afraid of rails so much. Um, another general tip, it's a one shot. Rule of cool, I think more than anything really dominates in a one shot. Like, is it fun for players to be like, oh, can I try this thing? thing that I don't know if it's going to work and it's a one shot and it's kind of crazy and you go, no, I don't think I'll allow that. Come on, dude. It's a one shot. Let him try it. Right. Even if you're not going to give them an auto success, make them roll for it and like have the consequences of either a mixed success, a full success, a failure or a part, you know, partial failure. Interesting. Right. That's one shot. Let him do and try cool shit. Right. What I like to do specifically when running masks is for a one shot. I like to have all of my PCs moment of truths already unlocked at the top of session. So like at any point, like they can be like, it's my moment of truth. I control what happens next. Right. And, and that's great. You know, I can let go of some of my jamming and let the players take charge. And what this looks like for D&D can be like, fuck it. Like if it's a one shot. You know, I guess you could do whatever level you want, whatever tier of adventure is interesting to you. Uh, but if I'm, for example, like playing a, you know, uh, sorcerer or a warlock or something, and I'm out of spell slots in this one shot, and it's the final boss fight, and I'm like, I don't, I can't do anything. We're not taking short rests. It's a freaking one shot. I'm out of my spell slots. I can't do anything as a warlock. Please, GM, please, can I have my spell slots back? Can I replenish my spell slots and you can do whatever you want to me in, in response? I would say yes as a GM. I'd be like, you get your spell slots back, but the villain gets to do this first. Or like, the you know, you have to form like a really deep pact with your patron to like get those spell slots back. And now like they own your soul completely or like something interesting in the fiction, right? You can really like have fun and be creative with like the crazy things your players throw at you. And you can also throw some pretty crazy things back. And one shot is the place as any to, to do that in um yeah so go big or go home rule of cool rule of fun don't sweat it too much in a one shot uh and that funnels me into the excuse me into the next point i'd like to raise up uh i've touched on this a little which is player expectations and making sure everyone's on the same page about what the one shot's going to be about and what the vibe's going to be uh and that that funnels me into a discussion about player expectations right uh so I like what I like to do as a GM is to get all PC info that I can before the session. So 100% of the game time is focused on actually playing, right? It would suck if you've like blocked away four hours and like the first two hours are you just doing character creation or session zero stuff? No, 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 don't do that. Do that. Do session zero stuff, character creation over text, over like your Discord DM, over your Twitter DMs, whatever. Or you can even like uh, hop into a call before the one shot, like a 30 minute quick, like bam, like session zero call to just get all all those things squared away before you actually play. If that's not possible, at the very least text about it, right? Um, what I do, what I used to do in the curated play program is one shots would be four hours long and the first hour would be dedicated to character creation um, and getting the team together and like answering those backstory questions. And that means we'd still had three full hours of just actual game and playtime rolling dice. Um, so I would say like, yeah, like session zero stuff, just square that away as soon as you can. Um, and Another really important thing, uh, I've learned this through trial and error. This is what works for me. It might not work for you, but this is what I have found to be the most helpful. When collecting player backstory information for a one shot, I make it really clear to my players, do not give me 10 pages of backstory because we will not be using it. I'm sorry, we just won't. Give me two to four sentences per question max. And I feel like the the like one punch man uh scene where like Genos is going off about like his like long tragic backstory and like Saitama is like stop 
summarize in 30 words or less. That's very much me, especially so in like a one shot, right? And the thing about that is I feel like especially for, well, maybe not especially for, but I've noticed this a lot in newer role players and newer players is they kind of overcompensate like their uh, unfamiliarity with a system or with a group of people, which is totally fair with like planning a lot about their character, right? Or like writing a lot about their character so they feel comfortable in it. But especially for a one shot, I think it's important to let your players know, like it's great to have like a solid idea for what kind of character you're going to play, but also like play to find out, right? Like stuff's going to happen in the one shot that is not related to your backstory, is not related to what I've prepped as a GM, that we're going to just figure out together, right? Scenarios are going to come up. You're going to be faced with choices. You're going to like see, be thrown into really fun and wacky situations that none of us could have anticipated. And half the fun is feeling your way out of it, right? Um, so yeah, just making it clear to your players that it's, you know, let's reel back a little on, on the backstory. Um, and a personal boundary I have as a GM, and again, this doesn't have to be true for your table or how you like to run things, is I don't like it when players bring in characters that they've already made into my one shots. Like for example, like they have like an OC that they play in every campaign, you know, or like they have like a specific PC that they bring to like various one shots where like, you know, they're like, oh, and the reason why I have a boundary around that is I, f I, I tend to find that those kinds of players, first of all, are, are really attached to a specific vision that they have for that OC and are, ve are very attached to a specific vision they have for how the OC will fit into a party and will fit into a story, which might not cohere with your idea and your prep as a GM. So it's up to you if you want to allow those kinds of characters in your one shot or not. But that's just something else to think about um, because it's happened a few times in my experience and I've always said no uh, but because i said no before they like completely flesh out their characters we were able to move forward and they brought in a new character right which brings me to another aspect of character creation something i really enjoy for one shots is when players make characters specific to the premise of the one shot right for a more generic premise like let's just stop a villain like it's less important that the characters are very specific to it it could be fun if like the characters were all related to the villain somehow or like all, all, i will always come up with like a one shot specific backstory question regardless of system I'm running right so taking the bad bombing a memorial uh example that I have um I'd be like what's your key? you know a question I my I might ask is to every PC is what is your PC's personal connection to this memorial right like why is it important to your PC that this memorial specifically is like salvaged right um or if it's like uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, premises that, I, that I've come up with and have run in the past successfully for masks is um, the four, your four characters, your team is receiving like Halcyon City uh, Heroes of the Future award at a gala. Uh, but like the gala is going to be interrupted by the villain you defeated that like that skyrocketed you to fame in the first place, right? So the villain seeking revenge against your group at the gala where you're being honored for defeating that villain in your backstory, right? So like a question I might ask um, each of the PCs is why do you feel unworthy of the award, right? That helps, that already helps set up like the tone, right? And the emotional stakes for the one shot before you even roll your first pair of dice, right? Um, and obviously like other things I'll come up with is like, what kind of villain did you beat, right? What did it look like when you beat them? And a lot of this is built into the mechanics of the system itself for masks. Uh, they have a, when our team first came together, X, Y, Z happened, like a uh, thing as, that's built into the rules of character creation. So I just sort of like homebrew it just a smidge during the session zero portion or over text, right? Like before the one shot to figure out like the specifics of the villain and the, the stakes at hand and, and what defeating the villain looked like, right? And like the, the consequences of defeating the villain and if any collateral damage that was caused, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I guess to boil down player expectation, uh, a summary of what I talked about, get PC info beforehand so you can focus mostly on, on the game itself, uh, make it clear that this is not the time for really long backstories and to get just like two to four sentences per backstory question you're asking, right? A three, as always, come up with like a, a one shot hook specific question or several that you want your PCs to answer. This is particularly helpful for a system like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, which I don't think have baked into their rules like a backstory mechanic, right? You, you've got ideals, traits, bonds, and flaws, but those aren't really backstory mechanics really they just help like flesh out your character a little bit more there's a backstory portion right uh of the character sheet but it's useful to have guided questions especially so in a one-shot setting 
Um, and to uh, tailor the questions to be to fit the kind of tone or the theme you're trying to convey. If it's a horror one shot, obviously one of the things you can ask is what is your character most afraid of, right? But if it's specifically like, let's say a haunted house horror where your four PCs are gonna be, are stuck in a haunted house or they're investigating a haunted house and it's sort of like a ghost hunters monster of the week situation, you can ask like, um, is your character a believer in ghosts, right? Or if that's if that's like the emotional crux of the one shot or something like um, this specific ghost uh, that you're investigating is related to each of your characters in a personal way, how, right? And like one character can be like, oh, I was possessed by this ghost growing up. Or like another character can be like, this ghost killed my family, you know? Or like a, a, another character can be like, this is actually the ghost of my grandma or like whatever, right? Really interesting stuff. Just to sort of manufacture player buy-in at the outset of of the one shot so your players are engaged from the beginning um okay so i'm gonna take a quick water drink and check the comments uh now's the time if you haven't already been asking questions to ask questions either about running one shots or any other thing about gming uh, or playing ttrpgs or running ttrpgs that might come up in your lovely beautiful little heads Thank you, C, for telling me that my camera moves around a lot. I'm so sorry. I hope it doesn't give you like vertigo or nausea um, that I'm bouncing, bouncing the camera around, but I will do my best to move around less. So hello, Paul. Hello, bears. Welcome in. Come on into class. Pull up a chair. Uh, I see that Mitzi has asked a question, but I will uh, address that at the very end. Thank you, Mitzi, for asking. So moving on to the final portion of this lecture, I don't think this lecture is going to be very long today. Uh, we're going to discuss how I actually go about prepping a one-shot session, right? And like how it might be kind of different from how I prep like a single session of like a campaign uh, instead of a one-shot. So the most important thing I do after I figure out the hook, the uh, premise, let's go with the gala, the gala premise, right? Um, as an example, uh, I figure out what happens at the beginning and what happens at the end. And once I figure those two things out, I reverse engineer it to figure out things that could conceivably happen in the middle. So for uh, the Gala one shot as an example, what happens at the beginning is I'm, I, this is, this is fun for me. I always open with a fight. I start the characters in media rest, like they're in the middle of fighting the villain that they know during session zero stuff they beat. Um, in order to receive this award in the first place, right? So this is kind of a flashback fight, uh, but they're in the middle of it and we see how they beat the villain. It's fun. I might like, uh, you don't roll dice as a GM in, in masks, but even for like low rolls, if the, even if they miss every single roll, I'll fudge it somehow to still make them come out on top, right? And like a lot of the fun comes from fudging it. Or it can be like, you actually got your asses kicked, but somehow, you know, the story got spun that you came out on top. And that's a fun like thing you could, you could weave into, into the front story, right? Uh, if, if that's what ends up happening. So I always know I'm going to open with a fight and then sort of transition out of the fight by excuse me, by pulling out of the fight and we reveal that the fight is actually playing on a projector screen and we're at the gala and like the heroes are on stage already and everyone's watching the fight that was recorded, right? Everyone's clapping and like an announcer is gonna come up to a podium and be like, these are the heroes of tomorrow, right? Um, and then like the, the next middle portion, the next hour, hour and a half is like, you know, the PCs get time to mix and mingle. Everyone they've ever known is at the gala, which is also really fun, right? And they get to mingle a little bit before like the award ceremony ceremony at the end, which is when the villain, and now this is, gets to the, the end of the session, which is when the villain's going to attack, right? So we open with a fight and we end with a fight. And I try to make it, it's important to me that the fights feel different and distinct, so not just in like the set pieces and like what the villain's capable of, uh, but also in the stakes. Uh, of the fight and the emotional core of the fight. Emotional core of the fight in the beginning can just be, we have to stop this villain. Oh shit, by stopping this villain, we were nominated for Halcyon City's best team and now we're getting this award. We won the award, right? Those are the stakes of the first fight. The stakes of the second fight, I always make it clear when the villain attacks the gala again, I have the gala organizers because even though there are adult supers in the audience who could easily band together and take this villain down, the organizer is gonna be like, wait, the team that beat this guy in the, you know, to get this award is here, let's just have him beat him again. So the stakes here are everyone's watching 
are you going to fail, right? This villain has had time to rally, has had time to come back, has a com- time to like um, plan against your teamwork and against the power suites you have, like, and is considerably stronger and smarter. Can you still beat them with all of Halcyon City watching? Or are you going to like go up in flames and like prove that you don't deserve the award, right? So like, that's like, that's like the emotional core that I'm playing with for the for the Gala one shot, which is one of the fi- my favorite one shots that I've written um, that I think is just a strong one shot. I have too my own horror a little bit um i might write an adventure path path for it for masks and release it or something on itch who knows um but yeah come up with a beginning come up with an end and you can sort of fiddle your way around in the middle and depending also on what your players like you want to make sure you inject as much opportunity for the kinds of play they enjoy so if your table really enjoys role playing give them a lot of opportunity and time to role play in the middle of the one shot right if your players really enjoy combat maybe like come up with a couple and like combat encounters you can sprinkle in right um and i always say don't over prep uh, but it's kind of an odd mix of you want to prep and you also don't want to over prep for a one shot. Uh, I've found that it's less useful for me to prep specific things to happen. For example, um, in sh- the Shoot Your One Shot series I ran on Transplanar RPG, uh, which was sort of the precursors to Endake anthologies, each one was about two and a half hours long. Actually, I think each one was about three hours long, three to four hours long, because they were like one shots, right? Um, I kind of over prepped for a lot of them. Like, for example, there was a high seas adventure one shot that I did, and they were all like sailors or travelers or stowaways on this like boat called the Ruffled Turn. And like the big thing that I knew was going to happen at the end was like a Kraken attack, right? So I was like building things up. I like gave them a lot of time to role play. And I had like a bunch of random ass encounters in the middle that I'd just written in case in case I hit a lull, which I never do, which I never did, which is another reason why I don't think you should over prep. But these were stuff like, oh, they, you come upon a shipwreck and there's an encounter with some merfolk, right? Or like, oh, there's going to be a whirlpool encounter, encounter too. And like, I didn't end up doing either of those things in any kind of depth or detail, right? Um, which just goes to show that you don't want to over prep too much for a one shot, but you do want to prep the things that are important, which is a beginning and end and a clear premise, right? Um, so yeah, I'll come up with like one to two, maybe like set pieces or like encounters or things that will happen in the middle, but no more than one to two, honestly, because I find my, it takes my players a lot of time to make, make it through even a single encounter, which is not a bad thing, right? I think this is a testament to like how deeply involved your players are with your world, which is a good thing if it takes them a while to get through stuff, it, because it means they care and they're really thinking deeply about, about what you're throwing at them. Um, another example I like to use is, I guess I don't... <laughs> Another example I'm going to use uh, is I recently had the privilege of running a one-shot for um, for Gen Con 2021 uh, on their main stage. Uh, not in person because of COVID. Uh, we were too scared <laughs> to show up in person, but uh, on their virtual main stage. Uh, and the one-shot we, I ran was basically fantasy pro wrestling. Uh, but the specific premise I wrote was the four PCs are like the performers of like a a pro fantasy wrestling troupe and your troupe is about to go under you're in the red right like this is and like the premise of the one shot is this is your you're putting on a show for a really rich and important woman uh and if you don't impress her then you're gonna go bankrupt and you're gonna lose your jobs but if you impress her then she'll give you arts funding to like continue being like a fantasy pro wrestling troupe so you have to put on the show of your goddamn lives right is are the stakes that i've set up which is also just a lot of fun to play with um and the i came up with a beginning i was like this is how i want to introduce like the space and how i want to introduce like how the show's going to open i want to introduce this important npc that's going to be like your stage manager and your director right um and i had an idea for how i wanted it to end which is um uh like a confrontation on stage with like the the heel versus like the faces versus the heel there's gonna be like a face heel turn and i like told my players pre this one shot during our session zero texts basically um like here's the storyline your director has assigned you to play out whether or not you adhere to the storyline is up to you right which is also fun right um and like here is the storyline of like uh the backstory of your troop itself and like the kinds of financial straits you've been in so they also had an idea for like um they just had like a little bit more dramaturgy so they knew how to play their characters a little bit more um 
complexly, I think. Uh, and the encounters I came up with for the middle included like various set piece like performances that, that could have happened. Like uh, like a wolf attack, right? As like the faces are journeying through this like like tundra landscape to reach the heels uh, citadel, right? A wolf attack, I'd planned like a, 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 a blizzard or a snowstorm. I'd planned like stuff happening with like frost worms. Um, guess how many of those I, I made it through before having to like um, just like cut to the, the the big confrontation at the end one i did the wolf attack and that was it and we were at like hour three and like the gen con producers were like you gotta wrap this up um so yeah i think that's just a testament to how long how deceptively long things can take uh especially when running a, running a one shot so don't prep like encounters so much uh focus on the emotional core of your one shot uh, and giving your players time to breathe and role play and interact with each other and really fiddle around with the set pieces, uh, the, the few but good set pieces you've, you've designed. Uh, and yeah, something else I'll do. This is really specific for me. It may or may not be useful to you, but I think I think it makes for a more engaging game personally on my end uh, is I like to write a little opening spiel that I'll like read out slash perform out slash act out to just ground the players in the world. Uh, and if it's an actual play production, ground the audience in the world as well. It's always nice to have like a little prologue or a little something, something like, you know, a couple paragraphs or a little paragraph or two to settle everyone into the world before transitioning into, I always like to do character introductions first. And I always like to do character introductions in media rest somehow. So for the um, fantasy pro wrestling one shot in media rest meant I like panned to all the PCs like frantically getting ready in the green room, right? And I was like, all right, what do you, like PC one, what do you look like and how are you getting ready, right? Like in the green room. And like that gave like each of the players like a little guided question to describe what they looked like physically and also like like put in a little bit of personality flair for how they're getting ready, right? Um, for the Gala one shot, I'll be like, all right, uh, it's in, literally in Meteor Rest or in the middle of fighting this villain. And I'm like, what do you look like? What does your costume look like? And how do you attack this villain, right? It's like how they introduce themselves as characters, which I also think is a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> That's pretty much it uh, in how I design a one shot. Interestingly enough, it takes me more time to prep proportionally for a one shot than it does for a campaign session. A lot of my prep for long running campaigns happens at the very beginning when I'm like prepping the entire world of the campaign and like just the overall like broad strokes of the campaign. Uh, but like session to session, I write a couple notes maybe before each session and I go right in if it's a, if it's a home game or I write a couple notes, uh, talk to my dramaturg, C and my editor uh, and uh, write an opening spiel if it's the case of like a streamed game or an actual play game because uh, I, I, I up the production value a little bit for those. Um, but that's pretty much it, right? Like figure out what's happening in the beginning, figure out what's happening in the end, prep one to two interesting encounters for the middle. If that's all you really have to do. Make sure that there's some sort of player buy-in, make sure there's a really clear objective and goal that the players are trying to achieve. Uh, and that if possible, the one shot is contained to like a single location or like one or two locations, right? It's TTRPG, it's not a film. So I guess theoretically you could change locations as much as you want. Um, but I'm a GM who likes to do travel monologues. So if I were to change locations, I would, you know, I it would feel weird to me to be like, and then we're gonna cut six months later, you reach like the Eastern shore of Asia, right? Or something like, after, like that would feel weird to me in a one shot. Um, so just like, you know, yeah. I guess, yeah, like it's up to you if you want to keep it to one location or not, but I like to keep it contained uh, because I feel like one shots are strongest and are most well suited for like s really clear, really strong self-contained stories uh, with really like juicy and evocative hooks uh, that don't bite off more than they can chew, right? So like a, a good one shot hook would be like, it's a gala, like, it's a single event or like it's like a performance as a single event, right? That you're trying to put on, right? Or like you're trying to stop a villain at this one place, right? Or like you're trying to go into this one dungeon as opposed to like uh, objective being like, um, I don't know, go to war <laughs> with this nation. <laughs> like that feels like a campaign hook instead of a one shot hook. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, those, that's pretty much, now my brain feels empty because I feel like I've squeezed it, uh, f wrung it dry of advice for y'all. Uh, so now I think I'm going to take a look at chat to see the kinds of questions uh, the audience might have that I can answer. So I'm going to start with Mitzi's question, which is what techniques could be implemented when weaving the one shot in a concise yet exciting manner, like acting slash writing techniques? 
Oh, that's a really interesting question. I would say, I would say get, get good. <laughs> no, I would say uh, practice, practice at cutting scenes uh, and like learning how to pace things uh, because I think that's one of the, the most valuable skills you can learn to polish as a GM is pacing. Uh, I'm still working on it. I tend to pace things on the longer end um, because I like to give my players room to breathe and role play. But what that ends up doing is, Laura knows this, anyone who's played a game with me, I'm so sorry, knows this, is I tend to run over, right? Because I like to let scenes breathe. And I think something I could learn as a GM is to cut scenes short, right? Like if there's a big laugh or like a big cliffhanger in a scene, even if like PCs have only exchanged a couple of sentences, if it feels juicy, cut it right there, right? Just cut it. like. Think of, think of it as a director. Cut it right there and then pan to another PC. Or you can even like do like a, a movie thing and like pan to what a villain's doing. Why not? Like the players know, but the PCs don't. The dramatic irony is tense and delicious, right? Uh, you could even do that. Um, I would say writing techniques. Um, it's not a bad idea to prep lines that villains could say or NPCs could say um, and, and to use them right? Like find a way to use them. Don't let that prep go to waste. Uh, and it's not a bad idea to prep maybe three to four sentences of description of important places or important people. Like something I like to do is I like to write like a really sexy description of each major NPC that my PCs will be encountering in a one shot or honestly in any sort of game session, campaign play included. And when I introduce them for the first time, I like tab over to that part in my notes and I'll just like act out and I'll, I'll like read out what they look like. But if it seems like I'm like improvising it and like, like making this amazing shit off the top of my dome but really i wrote it in, in advance and i'm just acting it out <laughs> you know what i mean um so that's a little cheap thing you can do for yourself to make make yourself look like a really dope gm which you I, which i'm sure you already are um but that's just like another another ace you can have up your sleeve um acting techniques for weaving the one shot in a concise yet exciting manner um know the amount of npcs you're going to be introducing in the one shot and just like make each of them pop Right, like give each of them like a specific, like both in terms of like the voice, but in mannerism and how you describe them, right? Um, if you don't like have a lot of character voices or like voice acting isn't your strong suit, like you can um, you can portray a character through like facial expressions or describing a little bit more interiority, right? Like you could be like, oh, she's gonna look at you, pause, and you see like her eyebrows furrow and like an expression of, what is it? fear flashes across this rugged captain's face, which is very uncharacteristic. Would you like to roll insight to know more about her? Right, you know, like, and you can prompt your your, your PCs in that way too. Um, and yeah, I always like to sometimes notes I'll write for myself if I have multiple NPCs in a one shot or in any game session, it's just like notes about their voice. So uh, for Quail Heart, which is an Eric Coker NPC I have, who's obsessed with another, who's obsessed with a PC in the group, I, the note I wrote for myself is low and slow. So Quail Heart, kind of talks down here and a note i have for uh lore who is another member of quail hearts party npc party is um high and fast so uh lore kind of talks up here and she's a little like whoa whoa she's excitable her eyes are real big she goes from left to right to left to right and up and down and an upside down and then i have and then i've got scrum scrum's all the way up here kind of also kind of fast like lore but a little bit more squeaky a little bit more goblinoid um but i am not a voice actor okay i i don't feel comfortable giving voice acting advice because this i actually think voices are one of i think they're my greatest weakness as a gm uh, so please don't take like voice acting like like take all of this with a grain of salt right like and um i feel more comfortable giving advice in terms of like describing through your own words how npcs act um, I hope that's helpful. So no, knowing when to cut scenes um, and uh, knowing how to make each NPC pop through voice and through how you describe the NPC and their interiority. Ooh, ooh. And I need to work on this as a GM. Talking less, talking less. So you don't feel so bad about cutting scenes short. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because if you're always cutting scenes short and then like talking a bunch as a GM, it feels kind of bad on the player side, right? Uh, so picking one or two senses to focus on when you're describing something and then and then just stopping your description, right? So it's like a, a tightrope balance because the feedback I've gotten is, Connie, you haven't described things enough, which I'm like, holy, I feel like I describe things all the time. And maybe even just recording yourself when you GM so you can re-watch sessions you've done so you can... Um, 
so you can improve. Uh, something that's been really helpful for me is editing the podcast past episodes of Transplanar from like over a year ago at this point. And something I used to do, which I think I still do quite often, is I'll stutter and I'll repeat myself in different ways that doesn't add anything new to a description. So if I'm describing a... Uh, a, a mural on the wall. I'll be like, you see a vast, colorful mural with a tiefling, uh, a loxidan woman, and a half-orc person. And they all seem to be embroiled in some sort of epic conflict. The colors here pop, they're vivid. You see reds of blood gushing uh, from wounds. You see like a a sky serrated by like a black jaw of a lightning bolt. And you see the, the night sky spackled with stars. And I could probably end it there. But what I used to do a lot is... And then you see the tiefling and, and you see a half orc and, and you see this mural's mount. I'll just repeat the things I've already said, right? Which I think I need to like learn not to do. So recording yourself and listening to yourself and specifically asking for feedback from your players about how can I improve as a GM can also be helpful. Um, but that's kind of a hard thing to ask your players. I think having a more guided question when you ask for feedback is also helpful. Like, how did y'all feel about how I did descriptions last session? So even better, how did you feel about my description of the mural? Right. And then your, your players can give you like actual, like uh, constructive feedback you can use uh, for the future. So moving on to the next question, uh, also for Mitzi. Hi, Laura, uh, is if ever, when do you sense that the one shot has a possibility of turning into a campaign or that it is best left as a one shot? I feel like that is less about what happens in the one shot, though that's also important, and more about like the real world limitations or desires of the players and the GM in the one shot. Uh, so for example, if I'm running for a table of random people in the curated play program, right, 99 out of 100 times, it's just left as a one shot because they don't really know each other outside of it, you know, and like I've got to, you know, are they going to hire me? excuse me, are they going to like take the initiative to like put us all in a group chat again and hire me? Because I probably won't because I, uh, back in my head, I was like running like, you know, multiple one shots a month. So I straight, straight up like didn't have time to like make those one, develop those one shots in the campaign, into campaigns. Right. Um, except for, for Laura, Laura stuck around. Hi, Laura. We love Laura, my champion, champion of my heart. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of that would depend on interest from the players at your table, uh, as well as like availability and like scheduling stuff. Right. As well as like, if like the one shot feels like it, it didn't end on like an epilogue, but ended on a cliffhanger instead of an epilogue. And that's happened to me maybe a few times running one shots, but it's important to me, uh, that, that I actually end one shots at like a good place. Uh, so it doesn't feel like there's there's more left. Um, but it can be fun to also end it on a cliffhanger, especially if you know the players at the table and like are interested in like turning it into a campaign, right? So a lot of that is up to you. It's up to like what you're capable of putting on your plate. It's up to how many spoons you have on a given month, right? And it's up to the players' interests too. If like all the players are really into it and they take the initiative to be like, let's make this a campaign. I mean, freaking go for it if you like it too. But if like the players are like, eh, that ah, was good. That felt like a good place to end it. Then you can leave it there too, right? Um, that's, so it's mostly up to you. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Paul says, what's something you wish more players knew while playing one shots besides your backstory advice? Go big or go home, my friend. Now is the time to pull out all the stops in your character sheet, right? Like, it, this is not the time to be squeamish with spending resources, right? Now's the time to, like, use your level five spell that you only have a single slot of. Freaking use it, right? Like, do all the things and do as much stuff as your your character sheet will allow you, right? That's one thing I wish, you know, that players would do. Um, let's see. Another, th another thing that I wish players knew when playing one-shots is... Uh, you can talk to your GM before the one shot about things you want to happen. Uh, and if your GM shoots you down, then I feel like that's more on them and not on you because I feel like that means you're being an engaged player and they're being kind of an asshole by shooting you down. Uh, but if you're playing in a one shot with me, I love it when players approach me being like, ooh, Connie, like I really want my character to be like this by the end or like, ooh, I'd really love it if you could bring in like a rival, right, in the one shot. You know, and that helps me prep the session, right? So before a one shot session, like, 
as a player, feel free to approach your GM, ask them if they're open to like discussing stuff, right? That you might want to throw at them for in the one shot. And it doesn't just have to be like set pieces or like encounter ideas or NPC ideas. It can also be like, I'd really love it if this one shot focused a little bit on like themes of like love and loss, right? Or like my character is really, like my character is in a really, I feel like I'm playing a really f emotionally um, uh, constipated character and I'd love for there to be a moment of catharsis somehow, right? Like these are things you can talk to your GM about as well um that i wish more players knew um yeah i'm trying to think of anything else i don't like, i mean I don't, uh something i've said this before but i'll say it again um be open to learning uh playing playing to find out uh you can have a specific and i think it's good to have a specific and strong vision of the kind of character you're playing um but also be open to things changing in a one shot because you never know where a one shot's gonna take you so yeah i guess those are the three things I would tell players to uh to to keep in mind. Uh let's see. Uh uh Chiakre says, what advice do you have for battles slash fights in one shots? In longer campaigns, I've seen fights last an entire session. Yep. So I'm gonna assume this is specifically DD fifth edition, uh, or Pathfinder oriented, because those fights tend to go a long ass time. Uh for a game like masks, fights can go pretty dang fast. Um my advice, my advice, okay, okay, this might be controversial, uh, is lean away from rules as written, okay? Uh, because I feel like what takes fights in fifth edition the longest time is when the GM does everything they're supposed to do, straight up, uh, is you calculate initiative for each monster group and every single PC, uh, you track hit points, you track AC, you know, like you, um, you, you, you know, you actually, okay, this sounds really bad. You actually make saving throws and you actually make attack rolls for your monsters. Like straight up, like any time you spend rolling and doing math adds to the length of a combat that's not fun, right? Like what's fun in combat is when you do stuff and you describe like how your magic missile hits it, right? And like, you you know, the terrain changes and, you know, the combat situation changes because of like decisions you're making as a PC and things that the DM's throwing at you. So... <sighs> okay, this might not be very actionable advice because the kind I would just say <sighs> homebrew your fights a little bit more. Uh, and how I homebrew D and D fifth edition fights to make them faster, punchier, and more cinematic is I ditch initiative. I never, I rarely, if ever, roll saving throws or attack rolls for monsters which is you're peeking behind the dm screen a little bit here so if you're if c t turn your ears off and don't listen to this because i'm always impartial yes and i always make rolls and they always i don't always do what the dice tell me to do um let your players have some w's you know like uh straight up like let your players hit more than they miss um or if they miss be like i'll let you hit if right like do those things um and even with all these homebrew things I've done, I rarely see one shot D and D fifth edition fights go for more than a single round. Uh, especially if you have four or five players and more than just one villain, right? Like if you have like maybe one minion group A, minion group B, and the villain itself, right? That I rarely see fights go for more than one round, uh, and that's how how I run things because every turn f in my fights matter, right? Every turn something shifts, right? Which keeps my players on their toes and like not like tuned out. They're just waiting for their turn. They're like, I know what I'm gonna do on my turn, so I'll just tune out until it's my turn, I guess. It keeps players on their toes, um, and I have a more dynamic initiative system so players can jump up and down in the order and they you know it's yeah so i would say <laughs> i'm sorry if this is unhelpful i might do another like lecture about like how i homebrew DD fifth edition fights and combat specifically uh, that might more succinctly answer the the, the question you, you have chiakres um but i hope that was kind of useful in some way and i know like a bunch of people have like on reddit have like <laughs> tons of opinions about how to speed up combat that doesn't completely homebrew it like to hell and back right and like those can be useful to look at as well but you know, straight up, let go of rules as written, I would say. Like, don't be so attached to it anymore. Uh, and just more think instead of like, okay, these are the actions my my villains can take. This this is the spell my villain can cast. Oh, but it's, you know, don't fret over... Yeah, 
specifically also in like theater of the mind uh one shot fights right like don't fret over feet and range and you know like how, like duration so much right uh focus more on the cinematic feel of the fight and and encourage your players to describe what they're doing and how they're doing it and just like you can just have monsters straight up die or flee or have them do stuff, right? You just be like, all right, they're going to swing at you and hit you for, and instead of rolling for it, just take like the number in the stat block, right? Like the average number. You can do that. You don't always have to roll. Um, you can just take the number. That'll speed up combat too. Um, I hope these like little tips have been helpful. I think I'm actually going to do another lecture about specifically how I homebrew fights to make them, frankly, what I think is better, especially for an actual play environment. Um, because I tend to find that D and D fights in actual plays that adhere to rules as written can be kind of a slog to watch. Not gonna lie, uh, which is why I try to lean away from that as much as I can uh, when when running D and D for actual play. Uh, okay, hope that was useful. If you have any follow up questions, Chiakres, just drop them in chat. If you have like any specific follow up questions, just let me know. Um, moving on. Uh, <laughs> there can be a hundred one shots in the room and 99 don't turn into a campaign, but one does. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm wondering if an avatar one shot I run might want to do more, probably just the group, not the same adventure, but maybe go for it, Laura, keep the group, maybe not the adventure, but Hey, keep the group, maybe even the characters, who knows, who knows, go for it. Uh, yeah, I think that's it in terms of questions. That's all I am seeing. If I missed any, let me know. But I'm glad it's helpful, Mitzi. And thank you for thinking my answers are great, Paul. Bears, I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I guess that's all in terms of the question, in terms of the audience questions I have. Um, I'm going to wrap up this lecture now. So first of all, thank you everyone for tuning in live to this. I believe I, I have Bears, Mitzi, Laura, C, Chiacres uh, in chat. So thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Uh, your patronage. Your patronage means the world to me. Thank you. I really, I can't do this without you uh, for like for real in like such a genuine real way. Um, and yeah, I appreciate all of your f feedback, your comments uh, on these lectures and uh, obviously your, um, your friendship and uh, being in my Discord server community. Speaking of which, I suppose now is the time to plug my Patreon during this outro spiel. If this lecture has helped you in any way, shape, or form, or if you want to see more where that came from, go to Patreon patreon.com backslash by Connie Chong. That's B-Y-C-O-N-N-I-E-C-H-A-N-G for as low as three bucks a month. You can pledge to my Patreon to get exclusive updates, GM tips, uh, live access if you're eight bucks or above uh, for Professor Chong's tabletop workshop, um, uh, sneak peek into whips of my uh, various TTRPG TTRPGs I'm writing, um, just the stuff that I'm working on. You get to take a look at and you get to support me too, which I'm always grateful for. Uh, so pledge to my Patreon today if you haven't already. Uh, and yeah, I'm also the GM and producer behind Transplaner RPG, which is uh, a lot of where I draw my examples of GMing from. So if you want to actually see me in action and be like, who is this person? What are they all about? Tune in Saturdays at 3 p.m. US Central Time on twitch.tv slash Transplaner RPG. Um, and yeah, follow us on Transplaner RPG on Twitter uh, and me by Connie Chong on Twitter, itch, Patreon, etc., etc. I think that's it. In terms of lecture 11, running a one shot, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'm so grateful for your support and I very much appreciate your attention um, uh, t today. So I hope everyone has a happy time zone. I'm going to transition us out of this situation here uh, and bring us uh, back into the goodbye screen. So thank you. Have a good time zone. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Much love to you all. Mwah, mwah. And I hope your one shots and your games are uh, as fun as they can possibly be. See you on the flippity flip. <laughs>